Alright, so we're back once again, and today I thought I would go over some of the people or some of the ships or some of the more animated things that you're probably going to meet over the course of the time you spend playing World of Warships. Now I've done some of the videos on this topic before, but I think it's just too much fun to ignore and uh, of course just in case someone looks at the players that I'm going to describe in this video and feel like it's looking in a mirror. Remember, <clears throat> this is only a fun video and isn't meant to actually describe any real players, unless I'm talking about myself, which tends to happen more often than you'd think. If you want to watch more of these outbursts in real time, and not just when they happen in video form, I stream at twitch.tv slash thedarkcoin every so often. Anyways, enough said about that, let's get into it. So first up is the Vermont player, and so with the Vermont being a relatively new ship and that I haven't talked about before, this is going to be pretty special. So much like the way that the United States of America has a little bit of a problem with obesity, the Vermont has a very similar problem, actually it's kind of crazy how the symptoms of obesity and Vermont tend to line up dangerously well. I'm sure Wargaming weren't thinking of this when they were making this ship. Anyways, let's go through a few just to see how well they match. So the symptoms of obesity include excessive sweating, hmm, I suppose you could be sweating quite a bit when you see the hail of HEs approach you and you try to run away at a measly 23 knots. Fatigue, again, quite, and quite understandable considering it's going to take you just that much longer to get into a good position travelling at 23 knots. So if that's all the negatives, what's some of the positives? Well, for one thing, as rates of obesity tend to increase, so does the size of the guns. And well, this is no exception for the Vermont. The guns on the ship are extremely potent, so much so that using them is going to feel like using a nuclear bomb to deal with the sniper. So, all things considered, not all that bad of a trade-off, I think. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm sure they'll be well thought out and reasoned. So next up is the Kamika, sorry, Shimakaze player, although those two are probably fairly often misinterpreted for each other considering how much the Shimakaze player thinks it's perfectly acceptable to jump into a cap at the start of the, at the, start of the game and contest it when the only TDs the enemy team has are Grozovoy, Daring and Marceau. And I suppose you're saying, really? How often does this actually happen? Well, enough to make me included in pretty much every single video I make. But then again, that probably says more about me and the actual Shima player. So, other than the first three minutes of the battle being a little bit of a shit show, what else can be said for the Shimakaze player in general? Well, for one thing, you're not going to have the guns of Vermont, that's for sure. But then again, I wouldn't put it completely past Wargaming to introduce something like that in the future. So, keep an eye out. Another aspect of the Shimakaze is the torpedoes. Not completely unlike the nuclear torpedoes that Russia is developing, Shimakaze's torpedoes are some of the most potent in the entire game, although whether or not the Shimakaze player can actually hit them is a completely other thing. So let's say the Shima player is actually good and can hit their torpedoes. Well basically all you have to do in that case is last hit the ships that the Shima you know, brings down to about 1000 to 2000 HP and proceed to make the Shima player fairly angry, which is fairly understandable considering you took all his kills, but at least you won the game. The other scenario is the fact that a Shimakaze player isn't all that good and can't seem to hit all that many torpedoes. In this scenario, well, the player will probably already know that they're not playing all that well through the end game chat fairly quickly. But let's move along before I run out of things to say about this player. So I know what you're probably thinking, what the hell is a Riga? And well, exactly, because I don't think I've seen a single Riga ship in the last 100 games I've played, although maybe I'm blind, who knows. So let's discuss how games with the Riga in them usually go. Although this might be a bit difficult considering just how little games they're in, but anyways. So much like any heavy cruiser, you're going to want to tank at least some damage, but being from the mythical Russian Navy, you're special, very, very special but not in that way. The other kind of special in that you can be an exceptionally strong ship and do a hell of a lot of damage in it. I'm not really sure why more people don't play the Riga. I don't, but that's for different reasons like not really liking playing cruisers in general. But for others, I guess it could be because Wargaming introduced a few more HG ships recently that enjoy a good amount of HG flinging. What this means though, for the poor little Riga, is that bow tanking tends to not go over all that well, and with gun calibers climbing a little bit in recent times, it might not be all that long before the Riga starts becoming penned much, much more, and bow tanking becoming a thing of the past. Anyways, I'm doing that rambling thing and not knowing what I'm talking about. Let's move along. So we reach the point of the video where we talk about everyone's favorite HE spamming battleships. No, not the Conqueror, it's the Thunder. 
So Thunder can be, and basically is played by two very different players, two very different ways. The first way being a player who is a little bit anxious to get into the battle, and also probably a little bit anxious about their ability to hit that broadside Kremlin from anything greater than 15 kilometers away. So in order to shore up said insecurities, they switch to the always potent HE in order to secure, in order to be So in order to shore up the insecurities, they switch to the always potent HE in order to make sure that they get at least a 10k damage from the, from the two fires that they're basically guaranteed to get eventually over the course of three salvos. The other player is a bit of a different beast altogether, and I guess all Thunder players exist on this spectrum, with these two players basically being on the opposite ends of it. So the other player is that player that can basically hit a duck sitting 26 kilometers away with the AP from the Thunder. And so as you can probably guess, they don't need to rely all that much on the HE from the Thunder. Although, of course, when it's needed, it's needed. And they're not afraid to use it. As a result, this usually leads to a couple of things. One, this player is usually accused of hacks. They usually sit at the top of the leaderboard and they usually have a PR above 2000 minimum. Let's move along to the final pair before someone writes 3,000 words in the comments section describing in extreme detail why just I'm wrong on every single point I'm making. So at long last we get to the player that I thought I would never actually talk about, and it's none other than the CV player. I'm calling it the CV player because I can barely name a single CV in the game to mention. Except for... Curio? But then, again, when I'm playing DDs it doesn't really matter, they all do half my HP in one drop. Hmm, so where to start with the ever-present CV player that basically stalks over you like an omnipresent god ready to strike you down in the stroke of a hand, and that's only the enemy CV. Your ally CV can also do much more harm than good. Also, which again is something that's usually discussed very lively in the ga in game chat. So ignoring the fact that some will drop fighters everywhere except this one spot where you need them, the fact that some of them will drop you to 2000 HP with a single drop of rocket planes, and let's definitely ignore the fact that if they want to focus you, there's basically nothing you can do, even if you are in a battleship, especially if you're in a bow tanking Riga. Anyways, let's try really hard to complement some of the good aspects of being a Riga player, or a CV player, sorry. <clears throat> So, good things. Good things. Well, for one thing, well, for one thing, if you have the better CV player on your team, your chances of actually winning the game actually increase by over 1000%. So, I guess that's fun. So, yeah, I guess this is the reason why I don't talk about CVs all that much. Hmm. Yeah, I should probably keep it that way in the future, I think. So, that pretty much sums it up for another video. Next video might diverge a little bit from World of Warships, but who knows. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next one.